it. So if you have your copy of God's Word, if you would stand with me, we'll read this and, and then we'll pray and we'll dive into the text. Starting at verse 27, it says, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat with tax, uh, and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. <clears throat> I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and others and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new one, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We ask that you would be glorified in what we say and what we do and think. And Father, we just pray that you would just reach into our innermost parts to challenge where we are wrong and where we need to come to you for uh, cleansing. And Lord, I pray that you would just uh, direct our hearts and our minds and our thoughts to you this morning. Pray that you would exhort us and encourage us that we might walk in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you. We love you. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Verse 27 starts with our text, and it says, After this, uh, after this being the healing, if you remember last week, the healing and the scene of the paralytic being lowered through the, through the ceiling. It says, After this, so... Uh, after, after that scene, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. It says he went out. Uh, Matthew and Mark actually say as he was passing by. Uh, it almost makes it sound like it's a random encounter, but we need to keep in mind that Jesus never does something casually or unintentionally. It's always purposeful. Jesus knew Matthew was there. He was heading on his way, and it may be that on his way to the next place, but he purposely, you, you see that in John chapter 4, it says that he uh, is going uh, by way of Samaria, and he says he needed to do it because there was a woman there that he needed to proclaim. Jesus never does things unintentionally, but it tells us that he saw a tax collector, you know, we don't like necessarily tax collectors today. You know, I don't know too many people that do that are really fond of them. And if you're a tax collector, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but tax collectors, they were the lowest of the low. They were also called, some translations will say, publican. It's interesting that later in the text, it's going to say that, uh, that he threw a, a, a party for tax collectors and others in some, in some of the gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark. It says, and sinners. It's interesting to me that tax collectors have their own category. They don't even fit with the sinners. That's how low they are. Okay? You, you cannot underestimate the severity of, of what they are in this day and in this culture. Pharisees would often pray, and they'd thank God and say, I thank you, God, that I'm not a tax collector. Luke tells us an account of this as Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18, 11. In Israel, you were not allowed to let your daughter marry a tax collector. They couldn't testify in a court of law because they were not considered trustworthy or honest. In fact, there's a story uh, in, in one of the, in, I don't remember if it was Josephus or somebody, uh, records a statue of an honest tax collector. And the reason it was so remarkable that they made a statue was because he was honest. 
I mean, that's how they viewed these people. Jesus understands their treatment, and later on in Matthew chapter 18, he's going to use their treatment as a means of an illustration for them that when you go to seek forgiveness, when you go to make something right with a brother, it says after you've done all the process that they still won't be reconciled, you treat them like a tax collector. I mean, that's the, 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 the depth here that you have to understand. And to be a tax collector really meant two things in the Jewish uh, culture. Number one, they were a traitor because they were collaborating with the enemy, with Rome. They had the authority of the Roman government to, to collect taxes, and, and this was, uh, they were, because of that, they were shunned by the Jewish people. Not only were they shunned, but their family was shunned. Not just a traitor, but they were also viewed as a thief, a liar, an extortioner, because whatever tax they collected... They collected a certain amount that they were obligated to give to Rome, and their profit, whatever they made above that, was what they got to keep. That was their salary. So oftentimes they would try and figure out a way to charge as much as they could, and the result was extorting for profit. Rabbinical law said that you should never trust a tax collector. That's Matthew. Okay, Levi uh, is his name here, um, but he also has another name. Matthew tells us his, the name of this guy is Matthew, and I think we should trust Matthew that, that he's not just making up a name because he's writing the book about himself. Uh, Mark tells us he's the son of Alphaeus, but at some point in Matthew's life, you know, some people say because his name was Levi, he was probably uh, uh, of the Levitical family. And so he was probably raised in the law. In fact, Matthew's uh, gospel has more recorded uh, uh, scriptures from the Old Testament than any of the other gospel accounts. So Matthew probably was raised up to be a, a priest. And can you imagine that at some point, Matthew decides, I'm going to be a tax collector. Imagine how that broke his parents' heart. I mean, this is a man who had been raised up. And, and at some point, he made that decision. Well, Jesus sees him, and the Greek word for see here is, is literally where we get our English word for theater. And, and the idea is that he gazed upon him, he beheld him, he, he looked intently at him. It's not just like a casually, oh, hey, there's a guy. No, he made eye contact, he's, 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 he knows what he's doing. And Matthew recalls it as, as I think this is significant. Uh, Matthew's the only one who tells it this way. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Everybody else says that he saw a tax collector. Matthew's the one writing this about himself, and he says uh, he saw a man. I'm sure for Matthew, he had always wanted to be known as something more than just a tax collector. The thing that was despised in his society. Matthew had to remember this moment with fondness. That here he is, this man rejected by society, and the now up-and-coming famous rabbi comes by and calls him and wants him to be a part of his following. In fact, in the gospel accounts, Matthew's the only one that records himself in the recording of the 12 disciples. You know, the accounts in the different gospel accounts. Matthew's the only one that says, Matthew, the tax collector. He never forgot where he came from. And for him to write down, Jesus saw a man, I think is very significant. He calls him, it tells us, he says to him, uh, follow me. Uh, uh, this is remarkable given the position Matthew had, an outcast in society who's probably hated. You know, I like to think through this, this text. What, what do you think the other disciples thought? You know that they have found archaeological evidence that fish from the Sea of Galilee were taxed? Can you imagine Peter, James, John, and Andrew, fishermen in that region, probably had been taxed by Matthew, probably extorted by him? They're probably sitting there saying to Jesus, I, I think you're making a mistake. This isn't the guy that you want following and be a part of this. I mean, were they bitter at him? You know, he was a liar, a thief. Jesus is going crazy. Can this taxman really be redeemed? Why him? You know, we read these texts and we think, oh yeah, Matthew, he's a tax collector. No, it's a big deal. It's a big, big deal. Jesus looked beyond all of it and he saw a man in need of a savior. 
Because Jesus doesn't accept us because of who we are. He accepts us because of who he is. That's the gospel. There's no hesitation in the text from Matthew. He's probably been listening. I mean, if he's sitting out there, he's probably heard Jesus. Is, this is in Capernaum, outside of the city, most likely. Uh, but he's probably heard Jesus preaching before. He's sitting there. He's probably thinking, you know, Matthew probably saw the rabbinical law, the Levitical law, and saw all of its corruption and said, I wanted no part of that. And now he sees a guy who's coming in who's going contrary to all the Levitical law, at least seemingly, the priests, the rabbis, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those religious leaders are in opposition to him, and he's like, no, that's a guy I can like. And all of a sudden, he comes by, and he says, Matthew, follow me. No hesitation. Gets up, and he follows him. Luke adds uh, in verse 28 uh, something that none of the other gospels do. He says, and he, leaving everything, rose and followed him. He gets up and follows him. He leaves not just something, but everything. Everything. It's probably a lot, too. Matthew most likely was the wealthiest of all the disciples. I mean, we're going to see here in a little bit. He has a great feast with a large company that implies that there's a lot of wealth here from this man. And and he understood somehow in his primitive knowledge that forsaking everything to follow Jesus was worth it. Maybe it was because he was despised and rejected by all his brothers and an actual rabbi was now calling him. Maybe it was because he regretted the decision to become a tax collector and he thought this was redemption. No matter what it was, whatever his motive, he saw in Jesus something worth more than all he had. Listen, when we come to this state of mind, this level of faith where we understand that no material, anything is worth keeping us from Jesus, that's a good place to be. In fact, we're told in Hebrews that the hero of faith in, in Moses, when he got to a place where he saw that all the treasures of Egypt were, were not worth it, and he said that he considered that the, the, the being persecuted with Christ, with, with the coming Messiah, were of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt. That's a good place to be. Note, though, that Jesus called, but Matthew still had to obey and sacrifice. His obedience changed the trajectory of his life, and his sacrifice ended up not really being a sacrifice, but a gain. Luke tells us later on in chapter 9, he says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his very soul? Paul is going to tell us in Philippians chapter 3, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That's a good place to be. That we would understand that, that all the material things that we have, and yet somehow, we, why we convince ourselves that the material possessions that we have are worth chasing after more than a, a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus, I don't understand. And you know what? I struggle with that. Until we come to this right place, what an amazing place it is. The text goes on in verse 29. It tells us, And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. So, so Levi, a.k.a. Matthew here, throws this great feast. Uh, it, it again, indicates his wealth. It's a large company, a great feast, not just a, a, a snack, but it's a large, great feast. Uh, you know, did he, did he throw this large feast because he wanted to invite all of his tax collector buddies and introduce them to Jesus? Maybe. You know, think about it. When, when, when a person comes to know Christ, how they want everyone to know. Especially somebody who understood that Jesus was worth giving up everything for. That type of mindset says, I want everybody to know this Jesus. Regardless, he throws this feast. It's a large company. Tells us tax collectors and others. The, the Greek word others there is alos, which means others of the same kind. So it's, it's men of ill repute, 
what classifies them as Matthew and, and, and Mark tell us as sinners. I'm not entirely sure. The, the, you know, who are Matthew's friends? He didn't have a lot of friends, most likely, or, or, or maybe they, the, you know, his friends just weren't the, the type that the people would hang out with. But it tells us he was reclining at table with them. Matthew tells us that the disciples are there with him. So it's not just Jesus. This is fellowship. This is relationship. This is significant. Again, what did the other disciples think as they're sitting around that table with Jesus? All their life, they'd been taught to despise tax collectors. All their life, they'd been taught that these men were, were, were despicable, traitorous, liars, and thieves, and we shouldn't be around them. We shouldn't talk to them. We're taught from a young age that that's a tax collector. You don't talk to him. That's a tax collector. He's, he's given himself to the other country that's oppressing us. And what are they thinking as they're sitting there? They must have thought Jesus doesn't understand who these guys are. He's getting it all wrong. Verse 30 tells us that the Pharisees figure out about it. It says, And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So the Pharisees somehow get wind of it, because there's no way they would have been there. They would never have been seen in that place with them. You know, is it the next day? Is it, is it that they heard about it and then they took a stroll down by Matthew's house? I mean, to associate with a tax collector they viewed as wrong. To eat with one would have been re reprehensible. Because to eat with somebody in that culture of hospitality is to become one with them. When you break bread with someone, you literally are, 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 are becoming one with them is the idea. And no good law-abiding Jew would ever think of doing so. so. So somehow, you know, Matthew and Mark tell us that they saw it. You know, did they walk by and, you know, because they got wind of it and they walked by and they saw, they looked in the window. I don't know, but either way, they, they hear about it um, and they're going to voice their objection. And this isn't an interesting objection, brothers and sisters. This is, this is significant to me. They show their cowardice. By going to the disciples and not Jesus. They're going to voice their objection with, G or with the disciples instead of going directly to Jesus. How often do Christians do that? They have a problem with someone, and instead of going to that person, we're going to go to somebody else. You know what that's called? Gossip. And it is evil, and it's extremely destructive to the church. Scriptures have so much. I was, I was talking to my wife about this, and we were just listing out verse after verse after verse that, that this addresses. You know, we think it's such a minor thing that we don't, we, you know, we minimize it. But the reality is, James tells us that our tongue is a flaming fire. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 4, 29 says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. I don't think the Pharisees are building up very well here. As fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. How many times when we go talk about somebody else to somebody else, is it building them up? Is it giving them grace? No, we're complaining about them. James 1.26 says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives, deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Do you, do you get the gist here? This is pretty significant. Matthew 12.36 says, I tell you, this is the words of Jesus, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. That should give us pause. Listen, when someone comes to you to complain about somebody else, you know what you need to do? Tell them to stop and go talk to that person. That's what Matthew 18 tells us. That's what the Word of God tells us. You listen, and, and I, I'm telling you this, I struggle with some of this myself. Venting, I'm just venting to someone. That's sin. There's no way around it. It's sin because you are not speaking uh, uh, words of, of building someone up. And whenever you listen to gossip, you're sinning. You can't minimize it. Brothers and sisters, this is so important. With many words, Proverbs tells us there is never a lack of sin. Their complaint, they, they, they grumble, it tells us, against uh, to the disciples, at his disciples, about Jesus. Uh, Luke says, why do you, Matthew and Mark say, why does he, uh, regardless of who 
uh, their true complaint was always only about Jesus. This famous rabbi, he's becoming popular, he's challenging their authority, and their complaint isn't about the disciples specifically, but it's about Jesus in an indirect way. And we do that sometimes, don't we? We're going to go and complain about somebody, and, and we give off a spiritual tone to it. Regardless of who, their true complaint, Jesus. He wasn't following their traditions and rules. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They obviously disapprove of his choice of company. It's guilt by association. Brothers and sisters, here's an incredible uh, application for us. Jesus is never afraid of your contamination of sin. He's never afraid to be with us. You can never be so horrible that Jesus will not come and be with you if you call him. You need to understand that. Despite what the world tells you, despite what what religious people tell you, Jesus is never afraid. He's not going to be contaminated by your sin. He's dealt with it. Jesus is going to answer for his disciples, starting at verse 31. I love that. He, you know, this happens over and over again. They come, they complain to the disciples, and Jesus answers on their behalf. He says in verse 31, uh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those, he says, the healthy, they don't need a doctor. The sick, they need the doctor. I find it interesting. Jesus does not dispute their claim against him. He's like, you're right. I'm eating with tax collectors and sinners. There's no dispute about it. He's essentially saying, you've misdiagnosed the problem here. The problem isn't that I'm eating with tax collectors and sinners. The problem is I came to call the sinners, not the righteous. You know, so Jesus essentially is saying, I didn't come to hang out with righteous people and religious people. I came, and and, and note too, because I think we'll get to this later, he, he also didn't come, by the way, just to hang out with sinners. People, people can twist this and say, well, this is my call. I'm, supposed to, I'm not supposed to hang out with church people. I'm supposed to hang out with sinners. That's not what the text is saying. He says, I came to call sinners, what? To repentance. Listen, brothers and sisters, if your Bible doesn't say to repentance there, you can probably stop reading that Bible and get a different one. Because while he does say, come as you are, he will say that all the time. He never says, stay where you are or stay how you are. The reality is Jesus' gospel message is always, stop sinning. Come to me. I forgive you. I cleanse you. Now change, transform by the power of my gospel to repentance. He goes on. You know, as, as many people talk about the importance of not just being with Christians all the time, I mentioned this, but, but there's truth to this. The purpose isn't to hang out with them, to call them to repentance. Believers, uh, being with a non-believer, it's not sin, okay? I think we, we can walk through this and understand, but our purpose isn't to fellowship with them. That's a hard one. Paul clearly tells us what fellowship has light with darkness. We are called to the world to bring them to Christ, not to fellowship with them and to hang out with them. It's to bring them to the gospel. They are sick with a terminal disease, and we have the great physician living within us who we need to take to them. That's our purpose. Jesus says, I am the great physician. I came to heal the sick. And and really, he is the greatest physician, right? He always is correct with his diagnosis. He always knows the perfect prescription, and he pays the bill. See, the reality in all of this as we walk through this, you know, we talk about this whole text is all about the love of God in the end. But Jesus' purpose when he came, it wasn't to be religious. It was to be relational with a purpose. Jesus always looked beyond the outward appearances of these people. You know why? Because he loved them. He loved them. Pharisees aren't going to end with that complaint. 
In fact, in, in, in uh, some of the other gospel accounts, it tells us that John's disciples are there with them, which is a really sad commentary about what's going on. But it says, they said to him, meaning the, the, the disciples of John as well as the scribes of the Pharisees, uh, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Jesus is going to answer them, and he says, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Uh, so they come with their next question. It's about fasting. You know, very well could have been that this feast was happening during a, a, a feast or a fast day. Uh, the Pharisees believed that you needed to fast two times a week, uh, and I think it was Monday and Thursday. Every week they would fast. Uh, Jesus is going to point out that the, their problem was that they would disfigure their faces so that everybody could know they were fasting because it was a religious thing. It wasn't a, 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 an actual spiritual thing. Matthew tells us that those disciples of John are there, and Jesus is going to answer all that. And he says, what kind of wedding makes the guests feast fast? Feast fast. I'm going to say that a few times fast, and then I'm going to miss it. When I go to a wedding... I'm not thinking about the ceremony. I'm telling you. And if I go into a reception hall and they have on the menu, we're fasting today, I'm leaving. I mean, look at me. I've got to keep this profile. This is a joyous occasion, Jesus says. He, he relates it to a wedding feast. He says, I'm, he, he's, he's telling them, I'm the bridegroom and these disciples are mine. They're the bridal party. They're the reception. They're not, I'm not going to ask them while I am with them to fast. This is a joyous occasion. You know that in, in Jewish culture, when you had a, a wedding, uh, you could actually, it was written in the rabbinical law that you could forego certain Levitical laws if it inhibited the joy of a wedding. Jesus understands all this. He says, listen, I'm not going to make them fast while there's this great joyous occasion. They were being called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Imagine Matthew sitting there. He had been a tax collector despised, and suddenly somebody took interest and loved him and called him. He's not going to say, now, Matthew, you need to be sober and you need to fast. No, this should be a reminder to us as believers, too, by the way. We're not called to misery and sadness and despair or anxiety. Some Christians walk around living in fear and anxiety and depression all the time. And listen, I understand the, the weights of this world. But we have the bridegroom not just with us, but in us. Christians should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. There's, there's, there's something there that we ought to understand. First Peter tells us, 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And what? Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The reality is Christians should be the most joyful people on earth because we have the blessed hope. And we have the great physician living within us. And people should see us and be like, there is something different about them. They are always, you know, no matter what despairs. That's why when, when, when you, you read about people who have been martyred for Christ, they're filled with joy even in the face of their death. You know why? Because they understand that they have a greater joy than the world could ever have. They have the bridegroom living within them. Jesus also is going to allude to a truth here. He goes on, he says, The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. One day, he says, the bridegroom will be taken away, and the Greek word there is aggressively taken from them. Then they will fast, and they did. And brothers and sisters, we fast now, not because he is absent from us. We fast now to draw closer to him. That's the reality and purpose of fasting. Jesus is going to go on in this opportunity. I love it. Whenever Jesus has opportunity to teach, he's going to take that moment and he's going to teach. And he tells us here that he tells them a parable and, and he tells them a couple of parables. He says, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. 
If he does, he will tear the new and the, and the place, I'm sorry, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good. What does all that mean? Again, 13 times, new and old, new and old. Starts with the patch, right? Uh, when you get a hole in your clothes, you don't tear up a new one to make a patch to put on the old one. Because if you do, he says they're not going to match and you're going to ruin the new one, you're going to ruin the old one. He says you don't take, the, 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 he, he uses the wineskins next. He says you don't put new wine into old wineskins. See, the reality is they would take the, the skin of an animal and sew it up and turn it into a, a, a wineskin. And as with age, it would dry up, it'd become brittle, and it would be less flexible, and so if you put new wine in there, it's going to eventually, it's going to ferment, and it's going to get, uh, uh, I don't know the process, but it's going to get to, it's, it bursts the, the skins because they're brittle and tight, and, and then the, the old wine skin's ruined, and the wine is ruined. And then he says the old stuff, right? Those who drink the old wine won't desire the new. They're going to say the old is good. It doesn't mean that they're, they're not saying, uh, 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 they prefer the old to the new, they're essentially saying, I ain't even trying the new. The old is good enough. If it ain't broke, why fix it, right? His point in all this, he didn't come to mend the old, but to transform it into something new. Jesus didn't come to fix the law. He came to finish the law. John 19.30, his last words on the cross was, it is finished. And the curtain is torn. Sermon on the Mount, over and over again, he said, you have heard that it was said. He's referencing the law. He said, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you this. He didn't come to abolish it, but you fulfill it. Jesus didn't come to reform Judaism. He came to establish the church. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He's talking about Jew and Gentile. One new church. He didn't come to, to, to reform Judaism. These Pharisees, these Sadducees that you're going to see, these, these teachers of the law, they had been drinking the old stuff, Judaism, and they're saying it's good. Jesus didn't come to rehabilitate, but to regenerate something new. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So what do we do with all this? Don't worry, mothers, I'll get you to your lunch appointment. There is no sin too great that Jesus won't call you. What a beautiful picture. He sees a person behind the outline. He sees a man. He sees a woman. You could be the most despicable person in your own mind, but that won't stop Jesus from coming to call you. I mean, it's the beauty of the gospel, right? He's not calling you to, to do something you can't do. He's calling you to say, I have done it for you. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus came, he lived a perfect and holy life, that even though you might be the lowest of low, that you might have an esteem of yourself that is so uh, pathetic that you could say, and I've had people tell me this. I, I remember when I worked in the factory, I had a person come up to me as they knew. They knew I was, I was uh, studying to be a pastor. They knew that that was my heart's desire, and, and it created two, one of two things. Either people came to me all the time, to, for counsel, I'm not even done, I haven't gone through counseling classes yet, okay? But they would come to me because, you know, as a Christian, as a pastor, that's where you get advice sometimes, right? Or they despise me. 
But they knew that if they worked with me, they were stuck there for eight hours, they were going to hear the gospel because that's what my heart was. And, and, and there was one guy, I shared the gospel with him uh, probably for a week straight. And it was an amazing thing. And, and we got to the end, and I felt like it was almost that, that, that uh, King Agrippa moment where he says, you know, almost you've convinced me. Uh, and, and he said, you know what the problem is, though? I've done so many bad things that Jesus could never accept me. I've had people tell me that. And I'm like, how, how highly do you think of yourself that you think you are beyond the holy God creator of the universe's power to forgive me? The reality is it doesn't matter what you've done. You could be Hitler yourself and Jesus has died for sins. And that's a hard thing to comprehend. But the reality is he died for all mankind. And he offers himself freely. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul clearly lays out for us in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It doesn't say, and you were a good person. No, it doesn't. It's by faith. It's by grace. It's by trusting in him alone. And not adding anything to it. And that's the reality is, as he comes, you have to understand how despicable in the world's eyes Matthew was. And Jesus saw a man and he said, come, follow me. And he offers that to anyone who hears this message today. Come, follow me. Don't walk away thinking you can't be redeemed. And what about the rest of us? I read this text and to me it's plain. Jesus wants relationships, not religion. His ministry throughout his life, his three years of ministry, is never about perfecting religion. It's always about relationships. His concerns aren't your traditions or your religious practices. His concern here is not about whether you uh, fully comprehend baptism before you partake in it. His concern here isn't uh, how, what type of communion bread you take, if it's really crunchy or if it's soft. <laughs> he doesn't care what has always been. Well, it's always been that way. The church finds all kinds of things to fight about through its history. We fought about not having musical instruments. Then we fought about having specific musical instruments. And now we fight about something else. It's just a never-ending cycle because Jesus doesn't care about any of that. He cares about our hearts. It's too easy to never get past the old because it's good enough. Listen, I'm getting older. I'm in my 40s now. And there are times where I look at my kids and I say, why would you ever think that's cool? And how often are we doing that in our churches saying, well, their ideas aren't right. I hope one day that I work myself out of a job because this church isn't about me. Yeah, I've been here a while, but if I'm not here, I hope the church continues. I hope that if I died tonight that the church goes on. You know why? Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. We cannot get so set in our ways and say to the next generation, that isn't how you do it. Jesus didn't care about that. We cannot look at every sinner and say, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to associate with them. Guilt by association. I don't want to associate with you because of your choices or your lifestyles. We look at the Pharisees and we mock them for how they treated the tax collectors and sinners, right? Look at how bad they were. Glad I'm not like that, really. I hope so. But who are today's sinners, right? Is it the homosexual? Is it the abortionist? Is it those who don't vote the same political party as me? Who is today sinner? Imagine if the church loves sinners the way Jesus did. I love John's account when he gets to the end of his ministry. He, he goes to have uh, that, that uh, last supper with his disciples. And in John chapter 13, 1, it says, and, and those whom he loved, he loved them till the end. 
And we already heard from John 15, 9, that, that Jesus' own words, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Imagine if we loved people the way God the Father loved Jesus. Probably change some things, wouldn't it? Listen, imagine if the church cared more about the soul of a person than their own image. Most of the time, sinners don't need to be told they're sinning. They already know. They need to be shown the love of Jesus and that through him is the forgiveness of sin. I wonder how many, tax, how many sinners today are sitting by their tax booths right now waiting for someone to see them as a man or a woman as opposed to just a sinner. You know that if you talk to the homosexual community, the vast majority of them say they want nothing to do with the church because of how the church has treated them. It's a sad, sad commentary. And I'm not saying this church, I'm saying universal. Doesn't mean we don't call sin a sin. We don't just ignore it. Jesus says you call them to repentance. You call them to repentance. The problem is so many don't even have an audience to call anyone to repentance because we've wasted it away by acting pharisaical. I love Mark adds a, a, a verse that's not in uh, Luke's account in when Jesus is talking to those Pharisees. They come to him and they say, why do you, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And, and Jesus is going to say the same thing. He says, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance but sinners to repentance and he also adds something in his text he says go and learn what this means you know what he says i desire mercy not sacrifice you know what that means it means that jesus desires a heart over the law because he's the sacrifice i'm guessing if all of us, myself included, would learn what that means. It might do some people a lot of good. Love people, tell them the gospel, and let Jesus work on their hearts. You know why? Because he's far better at it than you and I. Stephen's going to come up, and as he does, we're going to close in worship. But take some time. I'm sure that you have people that you can think of right now. connections that you have. And we need to consider how we ought to love them in a way that demonstrates the gospel, not pushes them away from it. You know, I wonder if Jesus were here today, if we might see him and say the same thing the Pharisees and Sadducees say, Jesus, you're reading with the wrong people. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you loved us in such a way that we, who were all great sinners. I think of the words of Paul when he goes through a whole list, a host of sins. And he says to the church, and such were some of you. Our story, no matter who we are, is always the same. Sinners condemned to hell and then Jesus stepped in. I pray that we would never forget that and that we would seek to point others to Jesus. I pray that our relationships outside the church would not just be a, an opportunity to be worldly, but that we would recognize our need to be in and amongst this world that we live in, but to call them up to and out of sin into your marvelous love. And Father, we thank you that Jesus loved us so much that he came to die on a cross for our sins. Father, I pray as we reflect on that, we would consider the trees and